information into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with the intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. Each episode we try and have a conversation with a contemporary thinker on topics of architecture and architectural thinking and our desire and hope and expectation is that somehow through these conversations we will learn a lot more not only about architecture but of the entire cosmos that goes into the making of architecture and architectural worldviews. Today I'm talking to my uh, good old friend Gordon Walker uh, and we are discussing the new book that has come out just uh, very recently documenting his life and career. Uh, Gordon began as a craftsman in the Midwest and then moved to Seattle uh, in the early 1960s and has been a very important part uh, of the local architectural scene uh, one of the people who has played a key role in establishing the vocabulary of the Seattle way of design. Uh, I talked to him about his life and career, his expectations about the current and the future, and also joining in the conversation is Kelly Rodriguez, who used to be the editor of Arcade Magazine and helped put this book together. Uh, of Gordon Walker's. Uh, the book's author is Grant Hildebrand. Perhaps we'll have a conversation with him at another time. Here we go. So congratulations on your book. Thank you. So tell me, Gordon, what got you into architecture? You're a passionate designer. Mm -hmm. This is what I get from the book and from the work that I've seen of yours. I still and, am. And you still are. And you're sort of this idea of the architect with his pencil and his drafting board hunched over the drawing, trying to figure the puzzle of design out. Mm -hmm. When I think of that image of the architect, you're one of the people I think about. So what got you into this business of thinking architecture? Well, the, uh, at the end of World War II, yeah. my father moved uh, his family from Iowa to North Idaho. Okay. He wanted to have a fishing resort. Okay. And they bought an old abandoned mining town. Yeah. Of uh, like 60 buildings. Yeah. That was built in the yeah, 20s. Yeah, I read about that, yes. And it was building, it, it had been abandoned for 22 years. And everything about it was reconstruct and rebuild. So I was, what was I, 10? I was in the third grade. And he had you hammering and away? I had my hammer and I followed my dad and <laughs> we would tear down one building to build another one and I would clean boards and straighten nails and I just got fascinated with uh, with woodworking. He was a good woodworker. So you come from a sort of craft inspiration? A craft inspiration. I'd say a that's exactly build inspiration? Right. Mm -hmm. right. And the University of Idaho um, was very akin to that yeah. um, because it was... Uh, they taught architecture, they still do, architecture, yeah, yeah. landscape architecture, interiors, right. so everything all in one studio. Yeah. And so it was a very hands-on, crafted kind of experience in education, so it all went together very well for me. Right, right, right. That's fantastic. But at some point, Frank Lloyd Wright also became an inspiration for you. Is that right? That's true. Yeah. Well, he, that was, it was 57. Yeah. And he died in 59, so yeah. he was kind of still... He was kind of on the decline in the academic circles a little bit, but not at Idaho. Yeah. And uh, I... Do you still hold by that? Is Wright still a... Uh, oh, I'm fascinated by Wright stuff, yeah, constantly. Yeah. I did, did. I personally didn't care for most of his elderly work. I liked his young work. Yeah, like I, what? I loved... I started with Oak Park. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I am going to be doing a little uh, presentation to Historic Seattle mm. uh, this next week. Yeah. And in that, I'm showing the Unity Temple. Yeah. Because the Unity Temple influenced me. Finally, when I got to Seattle, my first real commission was a concrete block house on Queen yeah, Concrete block, Unity Temple, and your Unity first Temple, house. I thought, my God, I've got it. What does Unity Temple have to do with the wood craftsmanship background? Well, it didn't. It was I had had enough wood craftsmanship. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to try something else. And Why? Well, I just think it was an adventure in learning. Yeah. 
and I couldn't get anyone to build a bloody house, so I built it myself. Right, right, right. And that was a, a great adventure because no one in the crafts area, the people who build houses, yeah. don't work with commercial materials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And concrete block was a commercial material. You do they look down on it. Yeah, they look sure. down on it. Yeah. And I thought, oh, it could be very elegant if you put it together correctly. No, no, wait, that, that doesn't compute from me. You come from a very strong craft. But, but when, you, when you go through and start looking at it, yeah. all the detailing is in wood. Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the right. ceilings are wood, all yeah. the floors are wood, the doors yeah. are wood, the yeah. windows are wood. Yeah. And I built all of those. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so it had that, but it just had the, the case to hold it all yeah, together. Yeah. So Unity Temple, mostly it's the materials that inspired you? or The form. Form. Yeah, and very nice clear form of the, the box in the middle and the serving pieces on the end. Right. And I just really like the diagram of it. Yeah, you were describing to me the Unity Temple and the sort of, uh, and your house, this this first project uh, project that you made, which was also in, uh, in, in masonry blocks, which had amazing detail. So it's the sort of combination of... Uh, of the the blocks with the fine detailing is that what it is correct that's what made it was hard against soft yeah uh, all the warmth came out it's a, it's a very warm house to yeah. be in yeah it was uh, it was never furnished yeah very well yeah uh, but that was a, another issue but the house itself was kind of strong enough to stand up to almost anything you wanted to do with it right it uh, it had a had major problems with my technical capability uh -huh. of putting it together so water didn't get through. Well, all great architecture leaks, we know that. Well, <laughs> for, for one reason or another. <laughs> but I spent uh, probably as much time back at that house trying to patch things and repair things and uh -huh. keep it keep it running, right. but had fabulous owners and they loved it. So, so you started in Idaho, what brought you to Seattle? World's Fair. Oh, really? I graduated in 62. Yeah. And I, I ran into a, uh, a young architect somewhere out of Portland. I I thought it was Salem. I can't, can't remember. Yeah. And I remember remember his name, sort of. And he popped into Idaho with a little sports car and a handful of drawings in the back seat and wanted to make a, have a slideshow. So he brought his slides in, and I was captivated by the guy. Mm. And I was captivated by his thinking mm. because he said, you know what you guys want to do when you graduate from school? You want to adopt a small town, go into a small town and sort of just get involved in the, the local community, the politics uh -huh. and help on the school board and help with things. And then what he had done, he was very good watercolor. He would render the street as it was and then render the street transposed. He was an urban planner. And he was into urban planning, and he did this, and it was beautiful, and it fascinated me. And, and why Seattle? Well, that's a long story, but it's a continuation. Yeah. I was in the Army at the time, and I had my training at Yakima, yeah. Yakima Firing Center. I see. And I went there every summer for six years while I was in college, uh -huh. and I thought it would be Yakima. And the more I went to the Army and did Yakima, Yakima started becoming, I don't think so. Yeah. And Seattle's World's Fair fascinated me. Okay, what and beautiful. Paul what? Kirk in particular. Yeah, Paul Kirk. And I just loved Paul Kirk's work. I was just fascinated with mm. it. And so I tried and tried and tried, and I could not get a job with Paul Kirk. Oh, no? No. I got a job with Ralph Decker. Okay. And Ralph Decker had just finished the old Seattle Public Library. Oh. And not a terribly good building, but it was classic Decker, and Decker yeah. was just a fine, upstanding sort of guy. Mm. And uh, I was there for nine months, and he gave me a raise of 25 cents an hour because I was becoming tolerant. Uh -huh. And it made me nervous. And what, so, does he, what did he mean by tolerant? Well, I wasn't yelling about how shitty the work was. <laughs> I'm terribly fond of his work, and I was very vocal about it. All right. And uh, so I was kind of not a classy, easy guy to have in the office, and I thought if I spent five years studying architecture and this is what architects do, I've made a mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I bought tools and went back to my trade. I see. And I had a, uh, my insurance salesman was a family friend of my wife's. Right. And they had a house and they wanted a deck and a backyard done and a fence. 
And you and would so I designed the backyard for them and built it. And then uh, it was summer and my wife was teaching and we decided to spend our three months doing our European tour. Okay. Of every cathedral in Europe in three months. And that brought you back to architecture. And that brought me back to architecture. In the meantime, I'd run into Ralph Anderson. Mm -hmm. And I really liked Ralph. And uh, we eventually became lifelong friends. And uh, I wrote, sent Ralph a postcard from Rome. And uh, when I got to town, everybody had said, Ralph, he said, well, we've got a guy coming from Italy that's going to go to work for us. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know about it. And uh, so I came back and I visited Ralph, and the next day I went to work. All right, all right. So well, you were at the World's Fair? Uh, did oh, you, yeah. Do you yeah. remember it? What oh, was it I like? It was it exciting? Uh, mm. No, it was just like a big fair. Yeah, the, sort of. the interesting part, the AIA had a booth. Uh -huh. and uh, Under the Space Needle? Mm, maybe that was where it was. Uh -huh. I, I can't remember that. Okay. But uh, did you know Bud Shore, Barnett Shore? No. Bud Shore was, uh, he was in, he was older than I. Okay. Uh, by, but he was in the same class here at the yes. UW. In the same class as Jim Olson, my future partner, yeah. and uh, David Fukui and all of those yeah, people. Yeah. They were all together. Yeah. Bud was a dynamic man. Okay. He, he did a lot of Hollywood set design stuff before he got into architecture. I think he was older, more mature. Mm -hmm. Bud was driving the AI, uh, the, one of those little trailers around, hauling people around, uh -huh. and was giving a spiel. And he gave the greatest spiel. Speed on what? On the World's Fair, taking oh, from this so to this to this yeah, to this. Yeah. And so all I this cool modern architecture. Yeah, and Bud was, a, you know, explaining all of this. Bud was full of himself. He's great. Bud so you fun. had it. So you enjoyed that, or you oh, thought it was boring? I totally enjoyed that. Yeah. And uh, but did you like the Space Needle? And well, the, I always uh, thought the Space Needle was a little over the. I didn't like it. I oh. like the Space Needle better today. What about Yamazaki's like movie? I liked him. I liked those the the space gothic part. Yeah, yeah. I liked those. Yeah. I, the the huts were you know they were just huts. Okay. All right. I was never a, a real keen Yamasaki fan, mm. but uh, the space gothic stuff I thought was pretty cool. Right, right, right. But right. The, the architecture of the fair really was. I mean, Key Arena. Yeah. Was now was probably the the, the signature piece. I had a. Uh, a chance in 1980, 20 years after 1982, mm -hmm. 20 years after, the city hired uh, Grant Jones. You remember Grant Jones? No. Jones and Jones. Oh, Jones and Jones. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the, yeah. 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 He's the husband. Landscape. Yeah. Landscape architect. Yeah, yeah. He hired three of us mm -hmm. to do a master plan for Seattle Center. Uh -huh. And I was very honored uh -huh. to be asked as a 20-year-old practicing architect uh -huh. to be hired for the city for a year to do that. Mm -hmm. And we went through a multitude of things, mm -hmm. and the only thing that we really accomplished, mm -hmm. it was the first of the master plan. Okay. Uh, there are still master plans being done in the center, and there's never one that's going to fit. Right. And what we decided that really needed to be done was tear down all the exterior buildings. Right. Because it was built in, in Paul Theory's mind, right. of being a Tivoli. Right. sort of a garden within a walled-in area. Yeah. And so they built tilt-up buildings all around the edge, yeah. which shut the city out. Right, right, right. And that was just this row of nothing developed around it. Yeah, yeah. And so it was terrible, yeah. a terrible I intervention. <laughs> and so we got those torn down. Okay, you opened thought, it up. That was the main thing. And I got the ballet school moved yeah. into exhibition hall. Okay. And they were my client. Okay. And I was doing that. So I... Those were kind of the two things that we accomplished. Okay. Well, Paul Theory basically wanted to kill me. <laughs> uh, I'm sure he did. His buildings on I'm the sure he, he did. was my age then. <laughs> and I can remember him standing up there croaking, You young fanatic, what are you telling your Always the young people creating trouble, you know. I know, it's like, we, we were. How do you think the architecture culture has changed, you know, since you started in the 60s to, to now? In here in Seattle. Well, I think the uh, the scale of the private practices of architecture uh, has gone way up. Yeah. Gone way up. Yeah. But it's all in really custom, fine stuff. Mm. I don't see the same results in most of the commercial work. Mm -hmm. The commercial work is B at best. Yeah. And It's uh, always been B, though. It's always been B. Yeah. 
and that's that's the best. I'm talking about more the sort of the, the design culture, the people who do, you know, interesting work like yourself or the new generation of people. Well, I th I think a lot of a lot of it. Um, I mean, my my former partner and Tom Kundig mm. are doing fabulous stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so is Miller Hall. And yeah. You know, those are the old ones now. But they are the old ones. They're now. the old ones. Yeah. What were the design values in the '60s and '70s, and how do you think those have changed, if at all? I think it's a broader spectrum that's yeah. uh, it's changed. I think the uh, the education in the last thirty or forty years has been been broader in terms of what people expect mm -hmm. and people want, and I think more people are looking to have uh, have design elements in, as part of their life than uh, d d did in the fifties and the sixties. Uh -huh. I think it was just a, a smaller a, a smaller uh, group of people, and it's a larger group of people. But it's the same. The ethic has remained. Pretty much. How, what would you describe as the Seattle design ethic? Light, air, and views. Light, air, and views. Yeah, if you got good views and good light and air, you're in. You're halfway there. Mm. Um, and I'm not necessarily with views. I yeah. think views are overvalued. I think you need outlook, and I think you need the light. Yeah. And you need to know where the light is coming from, and you need to know how to bring it into a building. What what is a core design value for you as the sort of the main thing that you're trying to solve? St with? I think structure. I start with structure. Structure. I'm really, really disciplined on structure, mm. and I believe that I believe it's really important that the uh, bones of a building are readable, uh -huh. and uh, that they are part of the aesthetic. Right. That means you don't have to expose everything, but there's a logic. A design logic that follows structure. Mm. I have the, the biggest problem I have working with young people right now, and particularly in Revit and other yeah. uh, systems. Yeah, they will draw the thing and never have the structure in it. Yeah, they will draw it without because you can. You don't have to have that necessarily. Or if they put it in, it's very faint. I start with a structure yeah. of how it's going to go together, and you don't come in and impose that on the on the very end. Well, it's changed, hasn't it? I mean, earlier we had to very purposefully put the structure together, but now with computing, looks oh, like they can sort of uh, they put can the structure in, in later that's and right. sort of make it work in crazy ways. And they do, and it, to me, it lacks a discipline that mm. I think is fundamental. But yeah. that's old. That's old thinking. I know it is. <laughs> um, uh, the 70s had a strong influence of sort of postmodernism, 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. mm. How did you, how, how did your practice respond to that? We did a little, we got into that a little bit in the more decorative yeah. uh, bit, yeah. but it, it was decorative uh, elements applied to a structural logic. Yeah. So I don't think any end of our work particularly would be considered postmodern. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it. I mm -hmm. mean, it seems like you sort of ducked around it pretty good. I remember uh, we had a, uh, a building called Hill Climb Court, which is in the market. Uh -huh. and uh, we Well-known building, yes. We submitted it for yeah. an AIA Honor Award, uh -huh. a national, uh -huh. and uh, Charles Gwathmey uh -huh. was on the jury. Who designed our museum here. Who designed your museum, the yeah. Henry. Yeah. Uh, was on the jury, yeah. and so he came out to look at that, yeah. and uh, I took him around to show him the building, and yeah. we had a drink afterwards, and yeah. I took him to the airport, yeah. and he was on his way to Portland, yeah. because the Portland building <laughs> was on the same jury, yeah. and uh, of course there was a bit of uh, competitiveness between he and Michael Graves, Michael Graves. Yeah. and uh, he said he hated that building, he said there's no way that that was going to be given an award. Right. Well, it got the award and we didn't. <laughs> and so Susan Boyle, bless her heart, yeah. in our bathroom made a little plaque uh -huh. and it was called the uh, Charles Gwathmey Ratfuck Award. <laughs> and it was above the toilet for years. I, <laughs> but I got, I got a kick out of that. <laughs> but two years later, yeah. I was on a, a jury for uh, a project that he was doing at uh, uh, he meaning Charles Gwathmey or Gwathmey, Mike Gwathmey, yeah, Gwathmey at, yeah. Uh, at UC Irvine. Okay. And I was asked to kind of do a preliminary critique on his building. Yeah. It was UC uh, San Diego, I beg your pardon. Okay. And uh, so it was really interesting and he 
sat down when we started the jury and yeah. said, don't I know you? <laughs> and I reminded me, yeah. reminded me, yeah. and he said, oh no, oh no. <laughs> but I didn't play any games. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. Uh, so you practiced in partnership for periods of time, then you've been on your own, then you've been more recently part of a uh, large practice with Mithun and... I was you part know, of NBBJ for a while. Yes, too. And, and NBBJ. So you, you've sort of I, shifted around quite a bit. Well, I have always, when I find that I'm not enjoying what I'm doing, uh -huh. I try to figure out how to fix it. Yeah. And it's normally by jerking the rug out from under my feet and falling That's on the floor. That's a good idea. Yeah. But it happens, and uh, you kind of gather yourself up and try it differently. Right. And uh, you don't build a continuity of a of a practice and build it up, you right. build a life. Yes. And it's more of a life, and I've been much more interested in life than having a magnificent practice. That's such a beautiful statement. It's more important to have a life, beautiful life. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and you have built yourself a beautiful house on Orcas, I, I, I understand. This is my the sixth house I've built for myself. Uh -huh. And this one I actually had a builder. I uh -huh. was the contractor, but I had a builder. Okay. Because it's all steel. Yeah, yeah. And it's all prefabbed in a way. Because mm -hmm. it was all trucked onto the site. Yeah. And uh, it was, uh, I needed professional help. Yeah. So I got a professional helper, and I did anything that's wood in the house, I did. Yeah. And the house is now 12 years old. Right. And this last weekend, almost everything, I have two guys there that are helping me yeah. repair everything that I built. <laughs> because it's what's kind of leaking yeah. or falling off yeah. or not wearing well. Uh, I see. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I see. Okay, so what does this say about life? It Is says it? if you can kind of tack it up and look at how it looks if you're building it, yeah. uh, you don't have to go back and put three more nails in it. If it's tacked up and it looks okay, move on to the next one. Yeah. So I was always kind of tacking to look at stuff. Yeah. Moving on to the next one, I was going to come back and finish it. Yeah. I'm never really very good at finishing. <laughs> That's interesting. You ran into Mercut in between uh, in your life and career, yes? Also Glenn Mercut, oh, Australian. Yes. Yeah. We were on um, a jury, a Sunset AIA jury okay. in uh, 60 or 86 maybe. Yeah. And he was newly... Uh, starting the career that he has now as a sole practitioner. 86? No. He started before that, didn't he? Oh, he, he started. That's when I ran into him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he had, he had been operating a bigger office. Yeah. But he just decided, I'm a one-man office from yeah, now yeah. on. Okay. And he had just started that. And he had done kind of his first steel house. Yeah. And it was famous. Everybody was seeing it. And Glenn was kind of a magnificent man that he is. Yes. And uh, I liked him right off the bat. Yeah. And so we were in communication back and forth right. over the years. Yeah. And I see him when he came here and yeah. things like that. Right. How has he influenced your work? I think the simplicity of my house on Orcas uh -huh. kind of speaks to it the simplicity. It has a sort of little bit of a market feel. It's a little feeling. bit of a market feel in it, I would say. Yeah. So it's so a yeah. really long plan. Mm -hmm. With the sort of a, a, a rhythm and the bass. He is a much uh, more accomplished technical tailor than I am. I see. Uh, my, my details are a little more... You don't fetishize details like he does. No. Yeah. No. Details just have to work. He really gets into the detail right. of things. Mine are more carpenter-esque. Yeah. And uh, it's something I could build. Mm. And if I can't build it, then I can't expect someone else to. I see. I see. <laughs> That's a good logic. <laughs> we got into trouble with some of the bigger buildings. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> well, I have. <laughs> I have. You're absolutely right. Okay. So, what are the kinds of things you are uh, you're, you're still practicing, or what? What are you? Uh, oh, oh, what, yeah. what are you? What are you? How are you? Sort of. Well, I'm just uh, living this life that you talked about. Well, I'm, I've been uh, consulting with, I've closed my office when I turned 65. Yeah, good and idea. I'm, I'll be 81 next week. Yeah. So that was 16 years ago. And since then, I have been working with Bethune as a consulting principal. Right. And 
they we started off 16 years ago of oh I they wanted me two thirds of the time uh -huh. and I was there more than two thirds of the time right but I'm by the pound if they have work I work yeah. if I don't have work well I've had work all the work I wanted with them until last year okay and last year it's really fallen off. Oh, really? It really fallen off. And I think a lot of it is my skill level has not kept up with technology. Mm. It's very, very poor. And I draw, and I draw, and I draw. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of redundant if I sit down I, and do the drawing, and then somebody else has to take it and reproduce it mm -hmm. in uh, Revit or whatever. Right. And uh, so it's, it's trying to learn new ways to work with them. Right. And uh, I haven't really picked up of how to do that quite yet. I have a few uh, younger architects. I always, I have not had but one client since I've been at Methune that I brought, and it was a ballet school. Mm -hmm. And since then, I've been, I've been bringing clients because I can't bring clients to the. I could bring clients to the firm and turn them over to the firm. Right, right. But they would rather they handle the client, and right. I understand that. Right, right. What what else are you doing besides working? But what I am doing yeah. is I have a house under construction. Another house? A big house. Yeah. Your own? Or no, my I call my house a cabin. It's really not a house. Okay. But some folks saw my house, like my cabin, yeah. and wanted a house. Yeah. And it's nearly complete. It's steel. Where, in Orcus? On Orcus? It's on Orcus. Yeah. It's on waterfront. It's, it's coming out well. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. I'm happy with it. I'm proud of it. Yeah. I have an excellent contractor. Okay. A fantastic client. Yeah. And uh, so it's it's going along swimmingly. Right. And I do, uh, my wife is an interior designer. Uh-huh. And she's been keeping me busy with her little projects. Oh, yeah. Of, I do her cabinets and I do a little of this and a little of that. And okay. And I do have a couple of projects coming up with Methune uh -huh. uh, after the 1st of uh, February. Okay. I'm back in the swing. Uh -huh. No, I can't imagine uh, not practicing or working. Right. I sit down at my desk and I will draw something every day. Uh -huh. So that's just the way I get my kicks. So now when you look back at your career and your time here in Seattle, mm -hmm. you know, do you think there's such a thing as a Seattle uh, style? I've been down that route a hundred times. I n not particularly, not particularly. It's VG fur, if anything. What? It's vertical grain fur. Vertical grain fur. Yeah, vertical grain fur. The material. The material. That's it. Well, that's kind of it. Kind of it. I think there was a. Uh, I think Kirk had a, uh, a pretty good handle on, on a, a Seattle architecture, a Northwest architecture. Mm -hmm. I think Ralph Anderson did to some degree. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was as clear architecturally as Kirk's work was, uh -huh. but I think it was damn good. And uh, I think others of that that era did uh, did work that I thought was Gene Zima did. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, but it's all kind of the same little bracket. Yeah. And I don't think people have built on that. I yeah. mean, most of the contemporary, the big contemporary houses that are being done right now yeah. could be in Seattle, they could be in Philadelphia, they could be... You think in, it's just genetic? It's genetic. That's so, a loss. I do think it's a loss. Mm -hmm. I do think my little cabin belongs here. Mm -hmm. I think it's a Northwest house. What makes it Northwest? Uh, probably because it's, it has a lot of grace to it, I feel, but it has it's kind of... It's kind of clunky. It has some kind of heaviness about it that uh, weights it down. It isn't. It isn't kind of free and finessed together. Mm. It's kind of crafted together. You think the Northwest is a bit rough and tumble? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Yes, Kelly. I have a comment. Yes. When I moved to Seattle in 1997, this might have been. This might have taken place in 1998, but yeah. there was a lecture at the Seattle Art Museum that I went to, and I was fresh out of architecture school, and I was kind of, you know, came from San Francisco, and I thought I knew everything. Um, <clears throat> Doug Kelbaugh was speaking about a Northwest, Pacific Northwest architecture, and I asked the question, what is that? 
uh-huh. and uh, he described a rugged individualism. Mm. Mm-hmm. Rugged individualism. Mm-hmm. Which um, mm-hmm. has come up a number of times for me, and, and in thinking about the Northwest and also thinking about Gordon, and I feel like what, what you two were just speaking about um, is descriptive of that title. Well, the individualism is a nice thing to add because that personalizes it. That's you're a, you're a rugged individual, Gordon. Rugged individual, yes. Yeah, you're not. Well, a, I've never followed a, the the uh, yellow brick road. I get off the road, and then, and I think that's the rugged part. If I look back at my career, I would probably iron out a few spots. Which ones? I don't feel that I have grown. A lot within design, I still see that it's kind of still it's the same little kit of parts, mm-hmm. and I'm just still roughing around with that same kit of parts. I told uh, I told Grant, and I think you were at that little presentation too, Kelly. I was showing the uh, the house that I'm doing on Orcas, and I said it's the last shed roof house I'll ever do because it was just getting to be an easy formula. Mm. to kind of use the shed right. rather than a flat. I'm trying to not do flat roofs. Yeah. I would be delighted to try a new a new building type. So what are you thinking? What What's the new type that attracts you? I would like to do concrete and wood. Concrete? Pour mm-hmm. concrete? Pour concrete and wood. Have you not poured concrete anywhere? Isn't uh, that a big material for you? I thought not, not as a major, what not about a, the, not a major uh, element. What about the pipe place building? Well, that's, yeah, but it's a concrete frame. Mm. I would, if I were, I'm thinking I'm probably not going to be asked to ever do a building, but I might do another house. Mm. And if I did another house, it would be more concrete fins and walls and forms. Concrete fins. Mm-hmm. Brisolet. My thesis project was a poured concrete yeah. monolith. Yeah. And that's what I would kind of like to do would be really a big expressive thing out of concrete. Poured concrete monolith, like a mega huge big concrete pour. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why? Why why suddenly uh Well it's just plastic. I was I was always was fascinated plastic. in school because of sculpture and being in an art school. Uh, the pottery room was right next to my drafting table, about thirty feet away. Mm. And I really liked pottery a lot, but I liked to build pottery forms. I didn't like necessarily throwing pottery Mm -hmm. as much as building slabs and forms and shapes and vessels. And I just thought it would be fun to to do something a little more geometrically organic. What do you think of Le Corbusier's work, his architecture? Oh, I I love it. Yeah? No, I love, yeah, Rocham. When I first saw that, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't. I, I really didn't like it. Really, I really didn't like it uh-huh. until I really started looking at it. And then, yeah. of course, when I went to see it, yeah, I was like blown away. Really? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did you go to the monastery, La Tourette? Yes, that's a big concrete work. Yes, and that's a good. I love that. Yeah, yeah, I love that because of the uh, the, the the discipline in it. Yeah, we don't do that much concrete work around here. No, we don't. No, we Why don't. not? Well, for the main reason, it's um, you have to build a double concrete wall because you can't insulate it. Mm. Or you do the concrete on the outside and then insulate it, and then something else on the inside, and that's not the same. Right. So you have to build a double wall. Yeah. And it's terribly expensive. I see. So you don't do it. Right. And that's been the new thing with codes. Codes of really putting clothes on buildings mm-hmm. are really tough. Right. Uh, because it, you hide the structure. Overall, I would describe your work as sort of a committed kind of co- a, a deep commitment to modernism. I think I think that's fair. I I can and have enjoyed doing uh, traditional work, mm. uh, but bringing a modernist twist into it. And there's something about traditionalism. Uh, when I lay out a plan, oftentimes 
I go right to formality in in the way I organize formal the plan. organization and organization yeah and I I use that a lot in fact I used to be teased a lot about that mm. well here it is it's another formal plan uh -huh. but it's a formal plan and then you give it a twist right but if you don't do that it's like it's like sitting down and playing jazz without really knowing classical music formulation I think if you know classical music you can play jazz differently Jazz is to classical music as modern architecture is to traditional or traditional is to modern? Well, I think you need to know the traditional to be able to do the modern. Mm. And I use that as a big, a big backdrop. So, I, I so you're saying formal plans formal. is not modern? Not necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. No, That's form. very more bold. I just use that, for, uh, I use that uh, as a guide for balance. A lot of times I'll go right into something... If I can't find another way to do it, I'll go right to something formal yeah. to uh, to organize it. Yeah. Well, it's the same way a, a ballet dancer has to have classical training in order to mm -hmm. dance. Twyla Tharp, I'm reading one of her books right now, mm -hmm. um, they have the cra classical training, but then they were able to do the most beautiful modern works, contemporary works, because once you have that foundation, you don't have to think about it anymore. You don't have to think about that. You can then you can dance. Then you can let go. And I think with architecture, mm -hmm. if you have an understanding of the foundation, then you can riff off of that. Right. What do you think is coming down the road for us, Gordon? What do you think are the important issues looking ahead for architecture here or architecture in general? I worry about a lot about the reliability of manufactured materials. Mm -hmm of uh, getting out on a limb by trying something new and having it fail, which I've done, and uh, siding primarily and windows. Tough, tough. Glue lambs, glue lamps. I haven't had trouble with glue lamps. Now, the new, the uh, certified timber construction that mm -hmm. new is pretty cool looking stuff. I, I mean, I, that's just fascinating to, to get your hands on to play with. Yeah. But you, you, uh, you need special projects to be able to do it. You need special clients to do it. So they're, they're still in the, in the experimental stage. I suppose that's what I like best. I like clients one-offs who haven't built a dozen things. If they've built a dozen things, they know what not to do. And if you're trying to enjoy experimenting a little bit, they don't want to experiment. Not developers. Not developers. You haven't said anything about sustainability. Is that any? What do you think? That's actually why I went to work at Methuen because I had no sustainability factor in my life. Mm. And uh, Methuen is not terribly fond of my house because it's an exoskeleton. Right. And the steel is exposed to the outside. Uh huh. And I did have a kind of a a way that I did insulate it, uh -huh. but still have it exposed. But it, they're still through webs that, that work. And uh, I just decided that I really wanted to have it look that way, and I just didn't care. So there's an element of not caring. Uh, I think... Uh, rugged individualism. That's the rugged individualism. Rugged individualism doesn't worry too much about ever yeah. the niceties of but insulation. I, I, I really respect trying to care for those things, and the young architects really do. I mean, they, they sure. say they do, and they really do passionately yeah, yeah, care I'm, about I'm, it. Because yeah. they just all say, well, we can't do it that way. Mm. I said, well, it's just this one little piece. Can't we do that? Because <laughs> it's going to look that I know it's going to look better, but we can't do it. And so you have That's to figure out. That's a loss, out, isn't it? Pardon me? That's a loss. Yeah, it's a loss. I mean, it's a visual and aesthetic loss. It is a visual and aesthetic loss. The so sustainability business has sort of really sort of, uh, uh, you know, camouflaged up good architecture, it has, has it not? It has camouflaged good architecture. Taking water off the roof and recycling water mm. and energy, that uh, that type of thing, I'm totally for that. Mm. Any way you can do it. Yeah. Give and take. I like Merkitt's, uh, one of his things he used to always say is, well, if it gets a little cold, put on a sweater. Right. You know, why does right. your building have to be ultra insulated? I know, I know. I keep my house at 64. Yeah. And uh, it was not even bad during the freeze last week. Well, the freeze froze the 
pipes and uh, our uh, we, we we have a par property on Arcus. Uh, oh, do you? We, yeah, but you we haven't built anything. Oh. Well, come visit. Okay. Yes, yes. No, I'm, we, I'm, I was in Arcus this weekend. We were there all the time. Oh, I'll be damned. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll come next time. Come next time. I'll show you my new house. I'm, I'm, I'll be excited to do that. Good. Thanks for coming to my office and for this conversation, oh, this Gordon. Is pretty interesting. You get me thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks also, Kelly, for being here. Yep, happy to be here. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is your producer, Sammy Prouty. We hope you enjoyed the conversation, and if you did, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Spotify. We would also love to hear from you if you have any suggestions for new topics or guests. You can always reach out to us via our website or Instagram. And remember, if you ever want to read up on something we reference in a conversation, the website is complete with a timestamp outline for each episode so you can further stretch your thinking. Thanks again, and until next time, this has been Architecture Talk.